Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 17th of January 2023. Martin North from Digital Finance and this here. Great to have you on. Very important show this evening. We're going to talk about some very, very significant issues about debt, how to deal with debt, what caused it and uh, what policy changes sh should be wrought ahead. Of course, there are lots of options, lots of opportunities to change things. And yet, on the other hand, some things we don't seem to be able to change. So it'll be a good discussion. Just before I bring the Senator and John Adams in, let me just... Uh, Remind you, we're not providing specific financial legal advice on the channel. Uh, do play nice in the chat room. It's moderated, but also feel free to throw in comments and suggestions. This is as of the 17th of January, if you're watching in replay. If you'd like to ask a question, make sure you use that Walk the World. That'll make sure it gets my attention and I can queue it up. I've enabled Super Chat, and that means if you want to get your question to the top of the list, you can do that via Super Chat or indeed make a contribution to what we do. And without further ado, let me uh, bring in the Senator first. Senator, are you there? Hey, Martin, how are you? Uh, very good, Senator. And thank you very much for spending uh, some of your uh, Tuesday evening with us too. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, I think this is a really important conversation that we're going to have tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I probably think it's the, the biggest problem facing government, uh, not just here in Australia, but most, most Western governments, is how do we deal with this uh, very high level of debt uh, in a way that isn't going to bring the economy down. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great. And John Adams, are you there? I am here, Martin. How are you tonight? Yeah, very good. And we should explain, John, that you're going to be on audio only. Um, I do have uh, a, uh, a a beauty picture of John Adams that we can put up, though. So when you're speaking, John, we can look at your picture. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, great to have you on the uh, on, on the channel and on the show tonight. So um, I guess what I think we want to do to start with is to just ask this question. I think we can all agree on one point, and that is we have significant amounts of debt. Uh, you know, globally we do, but in Australia we do. We have huge private debt through mortgages and elsewhere. We have huge government debt. We've got huge international debt. And the debt burden that we are now carrying is making being made more intense by the interest rate rises as they're now coming through. So while credit was cheap, it's no longer cheap. And so this is really creating a significant pressure point for us. And I guess the first question, and, and Senator, I'll come to you first, I think, is where did the debt come from? And, and was it deliberate or was it, was it a happenstance? Oh, Martin, <clears throat> in regards to motive, uh, one of the first things I was told in the Senate is never to impute motive. Um, but since you asked, uh, it's hard to speculate uh, that when the central banks lowered the interest rates to such a ridiculously low level that they just deliberately ignored the well-known consequences. This isn't an unintended consequent, consequence type situation we're in here. It should have been well-known when they lowered interest rates and, and prior to COVID, mind you, um, but obviously COVID, they decided to practically lower it to zero. Uh, here, here in Australia, at least, the, the Federal Reserve already done a pretty good job of almost getting it to zero before COVID. They, they must have known. And then, of course, they've been on a you know incredibly reckless expansionary po uh, policy uh, program, uh, certainly in the States. Here we, we printed $300 billion because of COVID, but the States have been, you know, I think they had $10 trillion in debt around the time of the GFC. They're up to $30 trillion now. You know, must, decisions, conversations must have been had in these meetings, or if they weren't had, they should have been had as to what are we setting ourselves up for, or what are we setting our children up for in the future if we keep engaging in these reckless quantitative and qualitative uh, easing programs. So, um, well, I won't impute motive. I will definitely say it was very reckless, uh, given that these so-called experts, I'm, I'm led to believe the Federal Reserve has something like 400 PhDs, people, you know, that there's people with four, you know, 400 people there with PhDs at the Federal Reserve, um, and yet they've allowed this to happen. So um, where did it come from? Well, obviously, credit is an arbitrary construct, uh, and it's important to note that there is two types of credit uh, and I discussed this earlier with you off, offline, and people often forget that, is that you've actually had debt and equity. And one of the things that really arcs me up in this country is that when I hear politicians say we've always relied on uh, foreign debt or foreign capital, sorry, I should say, um, and often, you know, 
reply to these people when they say that. I'll say, well, what, what is capital? And I'll often pause and I'll say, well, there's only two types of it. Um, and I'll, you know, it's a rhetorical question, so I'll answer my own question. There's debt and equity. And as a sovereign country, we already have title over uh, our, our natural wealth. And, you know, if we look at capital through the eyes of a legal sense instead of a financial sense, debt is a mortgage, equity is title. And for the life of me, I do not know why governments allow our untapped wealth, which we have title over, to be sold off or, or exchanged for a mortgage that imposes a, a cost on future generations. And, you know, if we take it one step further when it comes to two debt, um, you can have secured debt when you can have unsecured debt. By all means, printing money uh, uh, in an unsecured manner is obviously reckless and is, is, is not the right thing to do. However, for a government to secure the debt, or as I like to call it, equity, against a asset that will, you know, uh, that will generate an income greater than the cost of debt, there is nothing wrong with that, provided you know it's done in a reasonably cautious manner that doesn't overstimulate certain areas of the economy. But yet again, you know, as part of a government and as a sovereign nation, it is the responsibility of governments to provide essential services such as power stations dams, ports, airports, those monopolistic infrastructure assets that basically can't really have a competitive nature. And as we've seen, sorry, I'm on a bit of a rant here, as we've seen in the last 30 years with the privatisation um, and everyone thought that, oh, you know, these these so-called monopolistic infrastructure assets uh, will be able to compete in the market, what we've actually ended up with is a conga line of rent seekers um, basically looking for government handouts to prop up their inefficient practices. So... Back to your, um, you know, initial question, where does debt come from? It's an arbitrary construct, you know, and the question is whether or not you want the government to be in control of it or, or the private sector. And, you know, it, it's, it's basically, you know, a private, public-private uh, partnership whereby, personally, I used to like the way, you know, it used to work where the CBA was pro uh, owned by, by the taxpayer and owned by the government and people, uh, and then we had three large ma uh, major banks as well as a, a lot more minor banks than what we had now. Uh, many of the minor banks that were around 30 or 40 years ago, building houses, uh, building societies, et cetera, commercial banks, they, you know, they've all been pretty much consumed uh, by the big four now. Um, and, you know, we don't really have a competitive market and it's been very easy for the, the big banks to just lend. I think they lend something like 60 or 70% now to the housing market, which, of course, is a form of consumption, albeit, you know, housing is very important. Um, but we really need more more funds invested into the productive sector. Yeah, well, thanks for that. And uh, I wanted to give you a chance to go off your long run on that because I know it's a critical issue. Um, and, and, you know, my sense has been for quite some time that the neoliberal philosophy has driven a particular way of thinking about debt. We seem to have pushed a lot of debt into households, for the purchase of property, which has pushed property prices up. Uh, but, you know, if you look at the return that we've actually got in terms of making Australia better, in terms of, uh, you know, the infrastructure that we need or the uh, shape of the country that we need, I think we, we failed pretty much, re pretty remarkably. And this is a 20-year, 30-year problem, I think. So to my mind, it's a structural issue. It's a strategic issue. And it's been made worse, of course, by recent events and, you know, post-COVID and those sorts of things. John, do you agree that we've got a debt problem? Uh, yeah, yes, Martin, we have a debt problem. So, so the answer to your question, where did the debt come from, I would argue it came from Senator Rennick. Um, so, so, I mean, what I think people need to fully comprehend mm. in terms of where Australia is at the moment is, is that what happened in the last three years is 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 the biggest catastrophe since 1915, um, and why 1915? Um, because that's when we basically went through the Gallipoli campaign, and Gallipoli was a complete military disaster. So, Martin, I, I'm going to go. I'm going to take the audience on a bit of a journey. But but before I do so, I just want the audience to contemplate the position that many in the UK today believe that Britain's entry into World War One was the downfall of the United Kingdom. Before, in 1914, the UK was the biggest creditor in the world, the biggest lender, and by 1918, it was one of the biggest borrowers. So the war financially destroyed the UK, it destroyed the pound, and obviously it led to the setup of the UK losing the entire empire. 
And that's how catastrophic World War One was for the United Kingdom. So when we look at where we were prior to COVID, and obviously, uh, Martin, prior to COVID, you and I were doing various YouTube shows talking about private sector debt bubbles, particularly in the housing market. But when we look at what COVID has done and the decisions during the pandemic, so since um, the beginning of 2020, household debt has gone up, according to the RBA statistics, by $339 billion. Um, um, and, and that has created now that in, in, in terms of wealth, that's created three trillion dollars worth of wealth. But most of that wealth is just overinflated assets that have no uh, uh, bearing to realistic value. But when you look at public sector debt, um, basically we have now, um, um, in terms of if we look at, for example, if we look at say um, July 2019, so the uh, the beginning of the 1920 financial year pre-COVID to the forward projections, which is June of 2026, the federal government is going to um, accumulate $613 billion of additional debt, and the state governments will accumulate, the states and territories combined will accumulate $453 billion over that period of time. So the decision of, of how we responded to COVID, if we combine the federal and the state territory decisions to combine from, from, from the beginning of the pandemic all through to June of 2026, according to all the forecasts the various governments have put out, COVID management will cost government an extra $1 trillion in debt. And so by June of 2026, the Australian government and all the states and territories will owe uh, their, their, uh, their creditors $1.88 trillion. And there is no plan to pay that back in terms of public sector debt. And obviously, in terms of the, the, the in terms of the private sector, um, we have you know out of control inflation. We have, um, according to your own statistics, sixty uh, percent in rental stress, forty five percent in mortgage stress, and this was all based on the decisions that were made at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so if we want to contrast, because because Mark, uh, Senator Rennick in, in his opening said something which is going to be the, the centrepiece of this de debate, which is how do we get ourselves out of it? So Senator Rennick made the statement uh, that, he, that we want to be able to get out of this uh, debt bubble without bringing down the economy. Now, um, uh, everyone knows my position on that. Uh, there is no way to get out of this debt bubble without bringing the economy down. We have to go through a depression, and we're going to get into that uh, in, in, in terms of the second. But uh, if we can just contrast um, my record versus Senator Rennick's record. So in March of 2020, I knew COVID was not the risk that the government was saying. Um, and I wrote a 6,000-word essay on my website. And Martin, uh, you and I did a two-part series in April of 2020. And I was against the lockdowns because the... Um, uh, in, in terms of because the um, what we knew was that the modelling data was coming out of Imperial College in Al Ferguson um, was wildly inaccurate because he has one of the worst forecasting records uh, in, in in the history of pandemics. Uh, Fifty percent of, of cases in, in some of these famous incidents were uh, were, were I mean they were asymptomatic, so there was a lot of people who had COVID who didn't have um, who weren't actually um, being tested. And then we knew that the PCR test had a 30% false negative rating, which was that three out of 10 people who came back and, and attested that they didn't have COVID, they actually had COVID. So, so, so I knew as early as March 2020 that the risk to human life was not as high as what Morrison, um, and obviously Morrison is the Senator Rennick's leader at the time, uh, in terms of what he was saying. And, and, and because... On the cost-benefit analysis, because I knew that the risk was not as high as what the government was telling me, I was against the stimulus. Whereas if we look at Senator Rennick's record throughout the course of 2020 and then the, first, the first half of 2021, Senator Rennick basically endorsed the stimulus of his government, the Morrison government. He, he did not criticise the Reserve Bank's decisions in 2020 to cut uh, uh, interest rates into do quantitative Using term funding facility, um, yield curve control, and all the other measures that they had, and and so and so the, the real question is is that um, so the question is well where did the debt come from? Uh, the debt well, obviously we had a debt problem prior to COVID, but but what we did through COVID, what we did in 2020, 
has is going to be such a monumental disaster. People are going to look back in 20 years' time and, and re- compare Australia in 2020, similar to the UK in 1914. And it was a series of politicians in the parliament who, for whatever reason, and I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to, to understand Senator Riggs' uh, thinking of what happened in March and April of 2020, those decisions, both in fiscal and monetary policy, as well as um, other a range of other policies that were implemented by the parliament, uh, basically has bankrupted the country um, and basically led us towards a path of current stagflation. And Martin, you and I did a series of shows in 2020 about stagflation. And if we don't actually get this under control, we are going to repeat the mistakes of the Weimar Republic and we will see a hyperinflation episode sometime in the next decade. Okay, John. Well, thanks for that. Um, uh, Sandy, let, let you come straight back. Um, so John is basically arguing that um, the amount of liquidity that was thrown into the economy through COVID is actually a, a significant part of the problem. It was overdone. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's no argument for me on that. Uh, you know, I've got some pretty frosty text messages that I sent to the Prime Minister, Josh Frydenberg and Matthias. Uh, at the time, um, it would have been a hell of a job. However, uh, you know, notwithstanding, and you know, I don't, I don't want to go into the whole COVID thing. Um, you know, I, I want a day off from COVID as well. But <laughs> you can follow me, my views on COVID on Facebook. Um, but I, I thought it was overdone. But just, just, and I don't want to get into a, a, a you know slap down with John too much. But I, I was part of Parliament. I'm not a part of the executive. So those decisions were executive decisions. I was told not to fly down. The day they passed that monetary bill, um, and I wasn't happy about that either, um, because I did pose the overreaction um, in in the party room backbench meeting. But you know, politics, as you well know, is on one voice. And anyone who's watched my you know stand on vaccine mandates, I can scream as loud as I like and beat the drum as hard as I can. But I'm still only myself and Alex and Malcolm Roberts uh, and a few others. We're only about four or five out of the. 227 in Parliament. So I do try and call it out. Um, I have called for, if you actually read my maiden speech, quantitative easing in my maiden speech. Um, I have been critical of the RBA continuously um, throughout my time. So my stance, I, I, I call myself a protectionist in my maiden speech. So the fact I, I, I do dispute the fact that I never said anything in the first 18 months. If you follow my posts, I was you know, without going too far down the COVID post, I was calling out the PCR testing and the, and the ivermectin um, uh, and a lot of the shut lockdowns, etc. So, um, but but beside, I want to put that aside because I want to talk about the solution yep. uh, and a little bit about the history. So, John goes back to 1915. You mentioned earlier on before Martin, uh, yeah, in the last 30 years. I would actually argue we could go all the way back to 1776, and people often think the American Revolution was because of taxes. Um, you know, without representation. But as Benjamin Franklin, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said this, and I'll be I'll stand a bit corrected. We could have, we would have been happy to pay um, a little bit of tax had we been able to control our own currency. And what had happened was was that the early colonies had, had established the continental currency, uh, and the foreign banks were constantly flooding uh, the US, the, the new fledgling US colonies, um, with fake counterfeit notes because, as usual. Uh, the, the you know the banks, uh, the big banks, the big end of town, uh, refused to cede control of monetary supply. And the 19th century in, in the United States is, is a fascinating period of history in regards to monetary policy. Uh, there was always a big struggle between who should control the printing press, whether it be the public sector or the private sector. Um, and, of course, you know, Lincoln, I think, got his hands on it for a while. Garfield had a crack at it. They both got shot. Um, you know, Andrew Jackson, I think, shut it down. You know, this, and it goes back to Hamilton and Jefferson. Um, and ironically enough, the, the century finished with uh, the book uh, called The Wizard of Oz, which uh, I don't think many people realise is a story about monetary policy. But uh, obviously, uh, the private the privateers won out in 1913. Uh, and interestingly enough, as John pointed out, that also correlates with World War I. Um, and I'm not sure if World War, you know, I haven't looked into the connection between World War One and the start of the Federal Reserve in 1913, but it wouldn't surprise me if there was a connection. But it is interesting to note that by the end of 1945, the Bank of England was again nationalised. Before that, it had been a private uh, institution. And, of course, what had happened was, was that after the war, England, despite the fact that they were part of the winning side, got lumped with all the debt. Uh, Germany and Japan didn't get lumped with any debt. 
uh, and England then had to repay the debt. I think it took Great Britain something like 60 years to repay the debt uh, in US dollars, and that was a nice little sleight of hand that basically shifted the, the power of uh, the centre of the world's uh, monetary supply from the City of London, even though they still you know, have their finger in the till, uh, over to uh, Washington and the Federal Reserve. I mean, the Federal Reserve is obviously well on its way to controlling uh, the world's money supply by then, but obviously with the um, Bretton Woods Agreement, the, the power got shifted, of course, to the Federal Reserve. And so, so monetary, monetary policy is not something new. It's, it's often been a battle um, between the private and public sector, and it's been going on for centuries in the modern era. Um, uh, it was always a bit harder before paper currency came around because gold was gold and it was pretty hard to have control of printing gold and silver. Um, but, of course, here we are today. Now, in terms of the way out, John seems to think the only way out is through an austerity, um, is through austerity, and I completely and utterly disagree with that. That is what that is the policy that the RBA is pursuing in other central banks. They are jacking interest rates up too fast, in my view, despite the fact that they lowered them too low. They could. There's two things they should be doing. Number one, in terms of uh, qualitative easing, they should be forecasting, saying, okay, we will lift rates back to 3 or 4%, um, but we will do it over, we will raise it by 0.25% every quarter for the next three to four years, so i.e. 1% a year for the next three to four years to bring it up. Uh, because why on earth raise interest rates now when oil, the oil price and everything else is going up? I mean, it's not a counter-cyclical measure. I'm not sure what the um, opposite of a counter-cyclical measure is, but they're actually fire um, by, given that you know, fuel prices are up and the cost of living is going up, why, why increase interest rates now? I mean, they should have been increasing interest rates in the last decade when, when inflation was low, um, when people could have afforded a little bit extra. But, but the missing piece in all of this is, and I'm sorry if you can't see my hands here, but basically, you know, when you've got, you've got inflation under control when supply meets demand, right? Now, we've had a demand increase because of the, the excess monetary printing, spending or whatever from COVID, uh, and a lot of that money got saved and now it's slowly being released. And then we had the supply shock due to the Ukraine war and other measures. And when I say other measures, I'm talking about the general decline in productivity over the last three or four decades. I mean, three or four decades ago, we didn't, you know, let's, let's put it another way. Today, we've got battalions of academics. Uh, we've got battalions of gambling machines. Uh, we have battalions of financial engineers. Um, we'll have battalions of baristas. Nothing wrong with baristas. I'll have my coffee, so we'll leave them out of it. Um, but... You know, we have, coming from an accountant perspective, I was a management accountant for a part of my career, and we looked at things like activity-based costing. A lot of the things we do today aren't productive. And, you know, academia, you know, kids delaying their, their working career by four years to go and get a degree that, you know, is, is basically worthless or useless in any sense of the word. You know, I think we spend $30 billion a year on superannuation uh, for just glorified paper shuffling and, and, you know, money going into the back pockets of the unions and, and wealth managers. Um, so so we really need to, you know, so we've now got this problem where we, we're not a productive country anymore. We've outsourced all of our productivity offshore. Um, we're glorified blowhards, paper shufflers, pen pushers, you know, whatever. Um, and we need to bring back productivity. So rather than have an austerity measure, which is what um, the RBA is doing, so... We've had supply crash, so now the RBA is going to reduce uh, um, demand as well through austerity. Why not have a productivity measure that increases supply um, through productivity? And the best way to do that is to have a quantitative easing package, and we can cap it at, say, 2 or 3% of GDP, that is focused on building new productive infrastructure like power stations, um, roads, uh, railways, airports and ports in a productive manner that is going to provide long-term income uh, for the next century. And I'll just give you an example of how much money monopolies can make. Well, well, let's look at some of the monopolies we sold. We sold CSL off the top of my head for about $200 million back in the early 90s. Uh, just in uh, about three years ago, we signed a nine-year agreement with CSL for $3.4 billion or almost $400 million a year to clean the blood from Red Cross that you donate to Red Cross. So we now pay twice in one year what we sold the asset for forever um, today. CBA, I think we sold for a combined over the three tranches about $8 billion. It now makes $10 billion a year. Uh, up here in Queensland, we sold um, 
Port of Brisbane, or say we sold, we sold a 99 year lease on the Port of Brisbane to six times earnings. I, I have no doubt now that the Port of Brisbane probably earns that in a year. And by in, in given another 50 years, it'll be earning five or six times that in just one year. You know, in Brisbane, for example, we have 2 million people that live in the city pay $5 for a toll. You know, in 100 years' time, that'll be 5 million people paying 50 bucks a toll. So why not get a slice of the pie? Now, we were brainwashed at university to say that you can't print money. That is a complete oxymoron. All money is printed. The question is, who's going to print it and what are you going to print it against? Now, if you issue, and, and this is the thing, share, companies go out and issue shares all the time, right? They issue new shares and they're going to, you know, they'll either take over another company or, or for a new mining development. Why can't Australia issue new shares in the form of a bond via the, you know, an infrastructure bank that's owned by the people? And, you know, we can issue a bond to the state government, the state at 1% for 100 years against a, a, an infrastructure asset. The state government has to repay that 1% to the RBA, which is a hundred or infrastructure bank owned by the RBA. They then pay dividends uh, back to the Treasury, uh, and that's a form of generating income uh, for for the country. And that is a perfect hedge against inflation as well. Um, and, you know, I know many of you might cringe when I say this, but if you look at the model under the former national government, J.B. Occupation here in Queensland, in the late 50s when he was elected, Queensland was, was broke. And under his brilliant treasurer, a young treasurer at the time, Leo Hilsha, uh, they went on a, a, a building spree, basically, of, you know, opening up new coal mines, opening up new bauxite deposits, opening up new dams, new, new roads. I think he opened up more university state than any other state premier. The way out of this mess is to build. If we all got washed up on a desert island tomorrow, would you go to, go to the bank and get a loan? Of course you wouldn't, because there's no banks on, on, on a desert island. You would start building, you would look to control, you know, the supply of essential services and, and providing essential services. And we have a history of that. We, this has actually happened um, uh, here in Australia once before in 1810 when a, a bloke by the name of Lachlan Macquarie rocked up. Um, in, in, you know, in 1805 there was a drought. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the colony, the fledging colony, had relied on foreign debt up until that time. That foreign debt was repatriated, um, so there was no currency, no structure around currency, no understanding of currency, so they started bartering in rum. And, of course, you know, it literally ended tits up in the rum rebellion. Um, so Lachlan Macquarie came here and he realised that he could see, he was the first governor to see Australia as a potential country, not a colony, and he knows the three key things for a country, you know, if you want to be the government controlling that country, is to control your military and your law and order. Uh, control your taxation system, control your monetary supply. And he issued the holy dollar um, to build infrastructure, much of which stands in Macquarie Street today in Sydney, the Sydney barracks and hospital, for example. Uh, and, you know, that was how he built the nation. That's how Australia got its, got it, got its start and stabilised. And, of course, the sad thing is today that, that the holy, holy dollar is the logo used by Macquarie Bank. Uh, and their, their basic business model is to buy all the infrastructure that was owned by the people. Uh, and they clipped the ticket. Uh, as they manage it on behalf of the superannuation funds, that's still 10.5% going on to 12% of our, uh, our money every week. We were never, and I'll say still, because they get to keep it until you're 60 or 65, and there was never an election about that. No one ever asked the people uh, whether or not they wanted to give their money to someone they'd never met until they're 60 or 65 without getting uh, any guarantee they're going to get it back. Um, you talk about uh, vaccine mandates. Well, let me tell you, mate, that was wage step mandates back in early 1992. Thanks, Paul Keating. Uh, you really left this country in a mess with that superannuation and, and opening up the uh, country to foreign banks uh, in 1985. That was some, some of the best stuff you've ever done. I mean, we just didn't you know, allow foreign capital in to come in here or foreign, foreign equity come and buy a lot of our assets. And if it didn't get privatised to the superannuation funds, unelected superannuation fund managers, uh, it's now in the hands of foreign ownership. So, you know, uh, I think of Jim Mullen, who passed away today. He was always very concerned about national security, and if you want to control your national security, you better control your own national infrastructure. So it's very interesting, isn't it? Because the, the two futures are quite different from, from from you, Senator, versus John. Because you know John is basically saying you got to crash and burn to get out, whereas you're saying now there's an alternative, which is essentially to invest and build for the future. A la build. what was Absolutely. done. Mm. Yeah. But but those paths are very different, John. What what what, what why why doesn't what senator the senators here talking about work in your mind? 
Well, I mean, look, thank, thank you very much. I, I thought I was going to be left out of the debate, so I'm glad that I've uh, been able to rejoin Martin. But, but I was just, I was just going to say that, that the senator said a number of extraordinary statements we, we, which have to be addressed before we get into the solution. So the first thing that the senator said was about what his record is. Well, I, I've, I've gone through the record, the senator's record extremely carefully, and I've gone through three years of Facebook posts, and so I know exactly when the senator's position on on this whole issue flipped and it flipped in june of 2021 so so just just to give a bit of a contrast um in terms of being critical of pcr tests or anything of that nature on the 10th of june 2020 senator rennick introduced a motion in the senate calling on all members of parliament to help to follow the health directives now in in june of 2020 i was completely against all the health directives whereas senator rennick's position was that he wanted everyone to follow uh, the, hang on there that, that's not true i never introduced any motion to uh, hang, hang on hang on hang on no 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 hang on i've got the motion you posted this on the 11th of june 2020 and you said quote call on all members of this house and the other place who attended the protest over the weekend, this is the BLM, BLM protest, to comply with public health laws and directives. Your motion before the Senate on the on the 11th of June, 2020, oh, that was, was that to was follow... wedging Black Lives Matter. Hang on. So there's context to that. That was wedging what? Black Lives Matter. What, what, all what, those no, people, there were Labor politicians there at that rally I who know. weren't wearing masks. So they'd been running around telling everyone else to wear masks and then they turned up at that rally basically not wearing masks. So I was calling but, out their hypocrisy because but, 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 it was Graham Parrott and Annika Wells. I remember, I remember, I can remember it now, okay, no, no, because they were carrying on. Senator, 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 Senator yeah. hang, hang on, look, with all due respect, I didn't need to interrupt you. So, so, so yeah. if you, you can allow me to continue. But, but here's the thing. What the BLM protest showed was the whole thing was a complete farce. And I, I knew it was a farce before the BLM protest. The BLM protest basically confirmed that the whole thing was a farce. And your position in front of Parliament was to uh, follow the, uh, the the advice of the chief uh, of the chief medical officer and the chief health officers. That's what your motion basically called on all members of Parliament to do. Well, well so I have to read the exact well, words, but I, I know why I did it. It was to call out their hypocrisy. Well, well I mean, I think it's they like, were virtue I, I, signalling I, over it. I have the motion right before me. It says, "Quote: Call on members of this house and the other place who attended the protests of the weekend." to comply with public health laws and directives. That's a direct quote from your motion. Yeah, because the, they it, were the ones telling everyone else to do it, so I was but, but, out but, their hypocrisy. But, but, but the problem is, Senator, that the whole thing was BS to begin with, and yet yeah. rather than calling out the BS, you basically said follow, you, you backed it in. You backed it in all the way in 2020. No, it, um, no, 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 because, John, I had posts pulled down. You go back to I got beat up on the project in March 2021, I had posts pulled down about the PCR testing. I was calling out the lockdowns uh, late, um, uh, early, early 21, and I know I was doing posts against Palaszczuk in late uh, 20. So, and and I said, uh, I forget what I said, but I was going on Sky. I'd have to go through my Sky interviews because I was pushing back on what uh, Palaszczuk was doing up in Queensland with the border closures. Sure, um, sure. So but, 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 but hang on, hang on. You, you attacked the Queensland lockdown on the 30, 30, 31st of March 2020, but in 20, sorry, in 2021. But in 2020, yeah. you basically followed your Prime Minister, even though your Prime Minister attempted to put me in jail in 2019 with that ridiculous cash ban. So I was at war, even though I'm a former Liberal and a former Liberal advisor, I was at war with Morrison in 2019 because he was shown to be a draconian um he, he was a he was a tyrant in 2019 by this was a world first trying to put people in jail for using cash never not even the europeans were willing to go that far i don't know what did we learn in the last um look in terms of the last eight months he he basically had all these secret ministries i mean he had power this was the biggest well, we'll take that up since... with scott morrison i mean I, I can show you text messages here where i had it out with scott on numerous occasions uh and wrote numerous letters to him text messages him josh uh matthias i was uh, but, i was pushing but, but, the, but, 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 but the problem is senator in that in 2020 when when, when all, see all the critical economic decisions were made in 2020 and in that period of time there, there, there was other than Martin and I, and and and, and, and you know, if I'm going to be completely accurate, Martin was, was was had the opposite 
position to me. I mean, Martin in April of 2020 was pro-lockdown. I was anti-lockdown. And basically the audience turned on me. So I, I was against the whole thing at the very start and I've been consistent all the way through. But the other point I have to say, Martin, is that Senator Rennick said that he was told not to attend Parliament um, and because of the lockdown and, and all the procedures that um, that the Parliament had implemented because of, of the pandemic. Now, uh, he, he, his reality of this is, is that there, there's an Act of Parliament, anyone can look this up, it's called the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987. It's a criminal offence for anyone to interfere in the, in, the, in the conduct or the duties of a member of Parliament. So if Senator Rennick basically told his leadership, screw you all, um, I'm coming down to Canberra, I'm going to voice my opposition to the stimulus um, uh, and vote against whatever bill is before the Parliament, no one legally could stop him. So, so while yeah, he was no, given, yeah. while he was given the order, he followed the order, even though there, there was no legal effect to that order. So when he said, "I was told not to come," I mean, uh, he had every legal right to attend. It was his choice not to attend. Um, um, and 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 so again, he had the op now. And again, so so Senator Reddick said that Scott Morrison was in the executive. And Senator Rennick is in the legislature, so, so so that is correct, and there is a separation of powers. But even as a lone senator, there have been multiple hi ex examples in terms of whether it's in Australian history or in the United States or even in, in the British House of Commons, where the, the voice of one person can change the direction of of, of a national debate. And so Senator Rennick had all the opportunity to oppose the RBA, had all the opportunity to oppose. Um, Morrison and Freidenberg in terms of the stimulus, uh, but 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 what did he do in 2020? He backed it all in, and that is the accurate record of what happened during COVID-19. So, so 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 that is obviously a matter of record, a matter of fact as to who you know who could, which which people were on which side in that debate, and then obviously we get into the current position. So 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 now now we get into um, in terms of where we go forward from here. So, well, well, okay, so, hang on. So, so can I just, uh, Martin, have a chance to, to uh, yeah, make a statement yes. on, because John, yeah. John's obviously more interested in playing the man than, than the issue. But anyway, let's just go through this. Mm. He's right. Everything he said there was right. Um, I guess in March 2020, I'd only been a senator for nine months. Uh, well, not quite nine months at that stage. So in the end, I realised you're going to have to do that. Um and I, I probably didn't have the confidence in the party room when you're a newbie um, to, you know, stand up to the leadership. Um, in the end, I did over vaccines and vaccine mandates uh, and because it all happened so quickly. So everything got shut down on the Friday. Um, the package came out. We were told about the package Sunday um, night and then basically I think they flew down on Wednesday to pass it. So it was all sort of... You know, and, and we didn't know until like literally the day before who was going to go in and who wasn't going to go out. And I should say that I think we were all paired out. So um, for every one of us that didn't go down because COVID was so scary, um, we you know they didn't want many people going down there from the risk of spreading COVID. But you're right, and in the end, I've done that um, much. And you know, I, I cop a lot of heat. So why you're attacking me? Uh, because I've probably stood up to the party leadership more. I've probably stood up to Scott Morrison more than any other coalition member for that um, uh, matter. Uh, and, you know, there's a fair chance I'll lose my pre-selection over it, but so la vie, that is what it is. Um, but, yeah, look, that was early days. I was obviously finding my feet uh, and, you know, it was brought on very suddenly uh, and, you know, these things sometimes, you know, um, I won't say this. Yeah, well, it did catch me off guard. I think it probably caught everyone off guard. Uh, you know, I can well remember that Friday afternoon because the week before Scott Morrison was on Insiders with Brendan Murphy and they were saying, oh, just keep your hands, wash your hands and, you know, stay relaxed, and they were all up in arms saying they were taking it too easy. And Scott had gone to the Cronulla game the night before, and they were complaining about that. And we'd went from the Prime Minister going to a footy match and the Chief Health Officer telling us to wash our hands to locking the entire country down on the Friday. So, um, yeah, yet, yet again, it's 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 a fair point, but I, I don't see what it's got to do with solving the problem. And in the end, you know, once I found my feet, I had, had pushed back. Well, thanks for that. And look, you know, I don't want to spend any more time looking back. What I'm interested in is where we are now and what we need to do to go forward, because I think there are yeah. some really, really big decisions 
that we should be talking about and policies we should be talking about to lay the foundation for the next five to ten years for Australia. At the moment, my concern is that we seem to have got ourselves in this, in this doom loop where we're just going over the same ground and, and put the same policies and the same strategies again and again and expecting a different outcome. And yet we've got this debt mountain. And, and so the fundamental question is, we, we know how we dug a hole and we've covered that, but how do we get out of the hole, right? And it seems to me that it's fascinating that there are two completely different options to go out of the hole, but they can't both be correct. That's what I'm struggling sure, with. Sure, sure, sure but Martin, but, but, the, but, the, but the key question, if I can just make this one point, is why did they do the stimulus in March 2020? Because when we went through the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, there was no stimulus package. I mean, this stimulus package that was passed um, by the federal parliament, but obviously with the state, with the state parliaments and their stimulus packages, and then with, with the response of the RBA, this is the largest stimulus package in Australian history. It dwarfs what Rudd did in GFC, um, and, and obviously the reason why we have runaway inflation now is because of what happened in this critical period of 2020. So the question is, why did it happen, and why didn't we do? record stimulus um, with, during the Spanish flu. And obviously from a, from a uh, scientific point of view, the Spanish flu is obviously much more dangerous than, than what COVID has ever been. So, so, the, so and Martin, you and I covered this at the time, mm. is that um, we, you and I were warning about the um, household debt bubble and the foreign debt bubble that was, uh, that was at chronic levels in 2019. And so, um, even if we didn't lock down, the, the downturn in the global economy um, and, that, and the impact that would have on, on gross domestic product in Australia, that would have been enough to potentially tip the banks over. So because obviously the whole purpose of the stimulus, so with the, with the job keeper, job seeker, um, and, 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 and you know, one of the points I'll, I'll just quickly make is that in July of 2020, Senator Roenick went on Sky News and, 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 and boasted that the uh, Morrison package was generous, uh, whereas I thought it was very wasteful. But the whole purpose of Keeper, Seeker, um, all these other measures and, and the interest rate cuts and the QE, it was all to ensure that households had enough cash flow to meet their mortgage repayments. Because if they didn't and you started to see delinquencies and defaults, the banks would have gone. And so the stimulus. Um, was a conspiracy by Morrison, Freidenberg, the RBA, APRA, and the banks to keep the financial system going, to keep the bubble going. And so the reason why that's so important is, is that when we get to the solution, we need to understand that the, the, the bureaucrats that Senator Rennick has been going um, head-to-head with in some of these Senate estimate um, hearings, their job and their mindset is to keep the show going, to keep the bubble going. And so while you um, are in trap, while you're trapped in this vortex of we can't do anything, otherwise we're going to um, uh, result in a catastrophic depression, you, you're, you're, the only policies you can push is to, is to perpetuate the debt bubble. And that's what the stimulus package was all about. So in order to break free of this perpetual um, uh, printing of money stimulus cycle, you've got to bring the debt bubble to an end. Um, now, Senator Reddick said it's something very important from an economic point of view, which is categorically false. He said all money is printed. Categorically false. For 5,000 years, gold and silver has been the money that has, that has been the, the standard in which um, uh, commerce and economies have been able to operate throughout all human civilizations, irrespective of geography or race, whatever. So there's a couple of important examples that Senator Rennick gave. So let me give you an example. Senator Rennick, and he's made this on multiple occasions about um, um, Governor Macquarie um, and what he did with the holy dollar. Now, Senator Rennick is right. That prior, that, that prior to that, that prior to 18, um, uh, I think 18, 12, 18, um, 13, uh, 18, 12, 18, 13, when, when Governor Macquarie arrived in Sydney, we did have we did we did have a barter system, um, um, and, but we also did have a currency, and the currency was alcohol. And obviously, the alcohol you know, that wasn't a, a very effective use of, uh, in terms of a monetary system. So, so when he when Governor Macquarie introduced the the holy dollar, what was that? It was a silver standard. So he bought forty thousand Spanish dollars, which was silver, punched a hole in them, 
and basically use the outer ring of the coin and then the inner ring to to basically transfer the the whole Sydney economy from alcohol to silver. Um, and the way he was able to get alcohol out of the um, economic system um, was he created so much alcohol that the alcohol became worthless. And so that's what happens in hyperinflation. When you print too much of a fiat currency, the currency loses its value. Well, that's what Macquarie did um, with alcohol. He hyperinflated the supply of alcohol in Sydney, got everyone drunk, everyone stopped using alcohol, and then they used silver. Now, in the case of, for example, because Senator Renick has mentioned this in the past about um, Alexander Hamilton and, and the First Bank of the United States, and again, this was a government, this was not a central bank in the, in, the, in, the, in the context of what we understand the central bank to be today. But Alexander Hamilton, when he was um, uh, the Treasury Secretary under George Washington, what they constructed was a, effectively a government bank that would basically handle all the government's finances. It would also deal with um, the United States, the creditors of the United States, which, which were mainly European uh, creditors. But it also uh, basically did finance infrastructure development and i'm happy to have the, the, the discussion sort of running about infrastructure development but 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 the credit that was issued by the bank of the united states that hamilton created was backed by gold and so the two classic examples that senator Rennick has made in his maiden speech but also in various interviews is macquarie and hamilton one had a silver standard one had a gold standard and yet where we are today is we have a fiat system we have a fiat system that has no uh, back, that has no commodity backing at all. And so when you don't have, so, so the reason why this is important is, is that when you have a, a monetary system that's based on gold and silver, you can't print to infinity because you cannot manufacture gold and silver faster than in terms of what you can mine it. So there's a limit to how much you can expand the money supply. Whereas when there's a fiat system like we do now, both in terms of physical cash but digital currency, you can print it to infinity. And that's what the RBA did. So, so the whole premise that all money is printed is categorically false. Um, and so because we don't have a hard currency um, uh, monetary system, we have this huge debt bubble. We have this out-of-control inflation. We have rental stress at 60%, mortgage stress at 45%, according to our data market. And, and, and again, the, the question is, how do we get this under control? You have to shrink the debt. There, there is no, and and again, you know, um, I, in 2019, even before Senator Rennick became a senator, I had a meeting with the former member for Ben Long, uh, John Alexander, and one of his colleagues who's, who's still in the parliament, and they asked me about this uh, in terms of what do we do with the debt. And at that time, it was it was it was gov- uh, pub- private sector debt, and now we obviously have private sector, but also public sector debt. And I said to John Alexander and Russell Broadbent, I said to them, if you think you can wake up one morning and just click your fingers and just imagine or wish away the debt. You're living in a fantasy. The debt is here. It's out of control. The, the RBA, because they are so, um, uh, because they basically are trying to prop up the big four banks, um, they have to keep creating more and more debt to keep the banks alive. Otherwise, um, we're going to have a financial crisis. And so, Martin, you and I did a, converse, uh, did, did a show, I think, back in, I think August of 2022, and the title of the show was "Explosive Conversations in Parliament." Well, one of the convers- explosive conversations I had was with was with Angus Taylor, the current Shadow Treasurer, the Shadow Treasurer to Senator Rennick. And so, um, in that conversation, I was, and, and here's the thing: so when 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 Senator Rennick says, "Why are we raising interest rates?" Um, Angus Taylor knows because he told me to to my face that the only way to get inflation under control is to, to get the nominal interest rate above the inflation rate. So this is what they call the Taylor rule. Now, it's not it's not the Taylor rule because of Angus Taylor, but there's a, a US economist uh, by the same surname who came up with that. So so that's how we got inflation under control in the late 70s. That's how we have to get inflation under control today. You have to get interest rates up to a high enough level to bring down the rate of inflation. Um, um, and, and I said to Senator, so I said to Angus Taylor at that point, I said, even before you write your policies for the 2025 election, I know what you're going to write. I told him to his, the shadow treasure to his face, you don't have the guts to push the button. You don't have the guts to shrink the debt because shrinking the debt means depression. Um, it means uh, significant unemployment. It, it means a, a, a complete economic reset. Um, and there is no one in parliament who has the guts to say to the Australian people, we have to go through significant real pain 
to bring the economy into some sort of fundamental order. And so, Martin, you and I have made the point on multiple occasions, according to Professor Steve King, we need to shrink household debt by about two thirds in order to make the debt sustainable. And, and what that means is as you keep on raising interest rates, you're going to realize that many of these mortgages that were written in 2020, 2021, and 2022 are completely uneconomical. And you basically have to take out all those toxic mortgages out of the bank. Um, and then you've got to basically you know, deal with them in some form if you're going to have a, a sustainable banking sector. But even, even if you call, and then even if we start to look at public sector debt now, and, and here's where, you know, again, I, I'm a commentator outside of parliament. Senator Rennick is a member of the Senate, so he's actually in the system. So when we talk about out of control public sector debt, which was basically created, because remember, before COVID-19 in financial year 1920, the Morrison government, according to their own numbers, was on track for a surplus. And now we're basically, in terms of the federal government, we're, we're, we're looking at $1.1 trillion of, of gross federal government debt by 2026. How do you get that under control? You have to cut spending. Yeah, and, 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 and Senator Rennick may want to talk about growth, and, and, and I don't discount you know, the importance of economic growth and whether it's financing, infrastructure, et cetera. But there was a person in, in modern uh, political history who, who, who tried to play this fantasy uh, that you can balance the budget through growth um, uh, and in terms of tax cuts, and that was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was supposedly the biggest conservative. He dramatically cut uh, taxes in the early 80s and said that through cutting taxes, and this is the Laffer Curve theory, that by cutting taxes um, and, and generating economic growth, we're going to balance the books. Well, Reagan was in power for eight years. He had eight, he had eight deficits. And so if we're going to get pr public sector debt under control, we have to cut spending. And so, for example, if we look at um, where Labor's budget that uh, Chalmers delivered in October, the current deficit for this financial year, 2022-23, is $36.9 billion. So to balance the books, you've got to cut $37 billion in this financial year. And then obviously because the RBA is broke, because they're insolvent, because all of these bonds that they bought, uh, the, the, all the bonds they bought through the QE program have gone bad. You basically have, the only way to restore health of the RBA is you have to basically produce a large enough surplus that then you can go into the RBA and start buying these. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, you've got to start buying the bonds from the RBA and then and then trying to assist them in trying to restore their balance sheet. And that's the only responsible way. The only way to reverse QE is to, and, and this is what the United States did after World War II, was that they ran a series of surpluses over a decade and then they basically went back to the US Federal Reserve and bought all the bonds and then they were able to shrink the balance sheet of the U.S. Federal Reserve. So, so we have to get back to surplus. We have to get back to surplus um, um, as quickly as possible. Labor has delivered a budget the same as Frydenberg with four years of deficits. And the question is, where are the cuts going to come from? So 75% of federal spending is, is welfare, health and education. That's where you've got to cut. Um, and the question is, does Senator Rennick have the guts to say to the Australian people, we have to dramatically cut spending, abolish NDIS, dramatically, um, you know, for example, raise the pension age, dramatically cut uh, in terms of Medicare services and all of these other bureaucracies if we're going to cut, um, you know, 37, well, again, $37 billion just to balance the books, but we need actually a large surplus to actually start um, shrinking the balance sheet of the RBA. So we probably need to cut about 60 to $80 billion per year starting today. And the question is whether, whether the, where are those cuts going to come from well, I know where I would cut. I have the guts to say to the Australian people uh, that we have to make the hard decisions and, 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 and all the things that people expect. We have to reset expectations because one of the biggest problems that Australians have had for, tw for, for at least two to, two to three decades is people believe that our living standards today, it, it, um, it, we are entitled to this. Now, what we need to understand is, is that we have our gross foreign debt is $2.9 trillion. We have racked up the international credit card for three decades. We've lived beyond our means. Um, and, and there has to be someone in the political system who has to say to the Australian people, we've been sold a lemon for three decades, and now we actually have to go through the hard medicine if we're going to um, try to fix the problem. Because unfortunately, the actions of Senator Rennick and all of his colleagues in 2020 has bankrupted my children and probably my grandchildren. And it's going to take, you know, it's going to take the most dramatic and draconian um, economic policies in Australian history to turn the ship around. Yeah, John, uh, you know, I, I 
um, know that that's very strongly your position. Um, Senator, I'd like you to come, come back in at this point. Uh, the fundamental question I've got is this, that if in fact the answer is you've got to actually cut spending and uh, essentially you know, whittle it down, um, that is obviously a difficult path. But if you go back to the, the public bank and, and, and the Commonwealth Bank, you know, as it was previously, that actually was a way of creating sufficient momentum in the economy to be able to grow the economy to deal with the debt. I'm just wondering whether that is an alternative and is that perhaps, Senator, more in line with your perspective as to where we should be focusing? Uh, I missed that last little bit, Martin, but um, I'll just, uh, in, in terms of cutting spending, I'm not against cutting spending in the right areas, uh, but we need to be smart about how we do it uh, because, you know, un unlike John, I actually care about people um, and, you know, don't want to spend my nights attacking individuals uh, for the sake of inflating my own ego. Um, and, you know, the reality is there's a reason why, you know, I'm where I am and John's sitting there, um, the faceless man, uh, is because you've got to be able to relate to people and give hope to them um, and empower them. And John isn't interested in empowering people. He's interested in tearing them down uh, for the sake of winning a, 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 an argument uh, on a blog on a Tuesday night. And that sort of attitude won't get the country anywhere. Uh, but, yes, look, in terms of spending, the first, very first thing I said uh, in my maiden speech uh, after the introduction was that there is nothing more damaging to this country than the fiscal imbalance and the ambiguous responsibilities between state and federal governments. And I highlighted the health system uh, where we have nine health bureaucracies, whilst, you know, my hometown and many other small towns and even big towns like Gladstone are losing their maternity ward. So by all means, let's cut spending when it comes to bureaucracy. Um, if we want to look for money, I mean, I, I'm, I'm out there on the record of saying I think we should cut the tax rate, uh, lift the tax rate threshold to $40,000. I think it's completely absurd uh, that we tax people below the cost of living. Um, I want to make sure that people can keep their superannuation. If we got rid of superannuation, that's $50 billion in tax breaks. We could park in the budget and return to the battlers, um, 13 million workers in this country, $50 billion. That uh, works out at $3,000 each. Uh, that would be a way, you know, to give income tax cuts and let people keep their own hard-earned hard -earned wages. So on top of the $3,000 in tax cuts, they'd get to keep their own superannuation. Uh, and if they spent that money, you'd have a high velocity of money throughout the system. And, and, of course, this is what John hasn't discussed. He calls himself an economist. Uh, but all he can talk about is austerity, 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 and not velocity and productivity. Uh, and if we go... And the other thing, and I'm happy to put this on record, I've already told um, the Australian Financial Review about it, John Kehoe, is that we should have a capital gains tax on houses above $2 million. Effectively, I fail to see why hardworking Australians have to pay tax above $18,200 uh, a year uh, when they earn that uh, through their uh, hard, hard labour. Uh, and yet we've got these uh, you know, wealthy people living in the inner suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne versus singling away. Uh, but making hundreds of thousands of dollars in wealth every year, unrealised wealth, a lot of it, but uh, they're getting wealthy at the expense of uh, hardworking battlers. So your two biggest costs to the budget in terms of foregone tax revenue is superannuation and capital gains tax on housing. Um, and all of that money should then be returned to hardworking people, uh, as should uh, any um, childcare payments. That should go back to families as well and let them choose how they want to spend the money. And that might mean that uh, one of the parents actually gets to stay at home uh, and get more involved in school life, uh, which will help weed out the Marxism that's coming up through our school system. Uh, and so so I, I've got, you know, I think there's ways to do this without punishing uh, people through through no, no fault of their own. I mean, effectively what John wants to do is effectively punish people for decisions that weren't made by them. And, and I accept this is a political problem. It's been made by inept politicians uh, who have allowed themselves to be hoodwinked by... Not, not just neoliberal uh, philosophies, but, you know, let's throw in Marxism and communism when it comes to superannuation. Um, but, uh, look, you know, by all means, tackle spending where we, where we should, but we should never cut frontline services, and, and I want to be very clear about that. If, if anything, actually, I think we need to increase frontline services, and I have no problem in saying that because I know our teachers and our nurses and our police spend you know, most of their money. They're not on huge dollars. Um, and if we've got a healthier, safer uh, community, we'll have a more productive economy. 
And Senator, so one question on, uh, that I was wanting to pursue a little bit here. The RBA clearly had a significant role through, through COVID, taking interest rates ultra low. They did the term funding facility. Uh, they're paying significant money to the banks now, the difference between 0.1% and the, the current interest rate. So is the RBA part of the problem or part of the solution? No, part of the problem. Get rid of them, uh, bring it back in the, in the control of uh, basically the executive slash parliament. Um, I'm not against having an RBA, uh, but it, it should be accountable. And the only way you're going to be accountable, and, and I say that for a lot of these independent statutory bodies, they should not be independent. That's double speak or well in double speak for unaccountable and not transparent. I actually asked the RBA for correspondence between it and the Bank of International Settlements uh, for the last decade and they wouldn't give it to me. And Michelle Bullock admitted to me that if she gave it to me uh, in estimates that they'd no longer have a seat at the table. I mean, what does that tell you? That tells you that the RBA is nothing but a puppet for the puppet masters, you know, the faceless men at the Bank of International Settlements and the Federal Reserve. I mean, we, we just can't have this. I mean, you know, that's just absurd that, you know, the, the RBA won't disclose correspondent body uh, to an elected representative of the people. And, and of course... The- I mean, I knew this was always going to be known when I asked that question. Yeah. Oh, you're frozen. Hope you come back in a second, um, John. Oh, you sent yes, come back. Yeah. So the RBA part of the problem. You'd agree with that? Of course. I mean, I mean, I mean. Yes. So when we're talking about the 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 the, the heart of why we have the financial and economic problems that we have, a lot of it is because we we got off the hard money standard. I mean, um, I mean, I mean, the world was on a. Um, I, I mean, the, the world was on a, effectively a, a gold standard up until 1971 when the uh, uh, Richard Nixon closed the gold window. And ever since then, we've had um, uh, runaway uh, money printing that's built up the biggest debt bubble in the history of the world. And so, um, I mean, he, he, here's the thing. So we are, I mean, just, just to place this in, in the broader context, Martin, is that Australia has the biggest debt bubble in history. At the same time, we've got the biggest debt bubble in the history of the world. I mean, that is not a um, uh, hyperbole. That's not uh, um, the, that's no exaggeration. That is a, a statistical fact. Humanity as a human species, we have never been in this position before. Um, and, and 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 so um, the the you know I mean I mean so, so obviously you know the monetary system, what the RBA has done. Taking interest rates from say fifteen and a half percent in in, uh, in the ninety one re- uh, recession all the way down to point one, um, you know, not only that, but obviously the uh, the, the uh, policies of APRA uh, and the commercial banks that has been a huge issue. But, but Martin, can can I just say this because because Senator Rennick said something very interesting about about my morality and whether I'm heartless or not. There is no uh, more bigger moral dilemma in terms of. Um, economics than, than in terms of inflation. So, so, so you know, between the the Austrian school, if I could put it, and then you've got the you know the Keynesians and the socialists. There's always this big debate: what is more evil, and what is more um, painful for people? Is it inflation, or or or, or is it actually unemployment? Uh, I mean, I mean, if you start to talk to uh, now, now we know from um, in terms of various economics uh, and psychological studies, people feel unemployment more harder. But 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 again, inflation is an absolute killer. So the reason why I want to take the policies that I want to take is because I understand the impact that inflation has on ordinary people, and I am completely against those things. So so my moral position is not that I'm heartless. It is because. I've read, you know, uh, numerous um, books about economics and history, and I understand what happens when you get out of control of inflation that, that that could potentially lead into hyperinflation. So we have to get the inflation under control. But 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 also, can I say that if you, if you listen to Senator Rennick carefully, he talked about cuts, but he won't give us specific figures and specific actual programs where the cuts going to be. And because he talked about cutting bureaucracy, and I'm all for that. I'm all for shutting down various agencies. But if you think you're going to cut $37 billion in federal spending just by sucking a few bureaucrats, um, that's not going to cut it. You have to cut programs. You have to cut them deeply. Um, um, and you have to level with, with the public in terms of um, uh, I mean, I mean, you have to level the public in terms of trying to resolve these issues. So, and and and, but, and obviously, in terms of the RBA, I mean, I, mean, I think 
in my last debate with Robbie Barwick, I was very crystal clear about this, is that if I was Prime Minister tonight, within the first hour, I would end central bank independence. I would call a meeting of the RBA. I would dramatically raise interest rates and pop the bubble immediately because the faster you do it and the, and, and, and the, and the faster you do it and the more sooner you do it, the sooner you can get to a problem, the sooner you can get to a solution and a more sustainable economy. So, so I have... No hesitation. I mean, and, and again, so the other thing I, I just wanted to say is, is that there's been only one person in federal political history who had the guts to make the right decision, and that was Joseph Lyons. He won the largest victory in Australian federal politics in 1931, 58 and a half, two PP. Um, I mean, it, it was bigger than Rudd or bigger than Fraser or, or bigger than Curtin in 1943. Um, the one person who had the guts who basically stood on principle, was willing to quit the Labor cabinet, willing to, the, willing to quit the Labor Party after our whole Korean Labor, said, we're not going, we're not going to follow the, the, the mistakes of the Weimar Republic in Germany. And, and he basically was willing to implement austerity in order to um, save um, the Australian economy from, from, from a catastrophic uh, financial crisis. And yes, unemployment went to 32%, the second highest behind Germany. But there were, you know, there were other policies playing uh, a role in that. But uh, we we went into uh, a, a deep depression, uh, in, in the Great Depression. But we we but we came we came out of it relatively quickly, um, and we were able to be on a sustainable basis. And the performance of the Australian economy in the, in the 1930s. Far, was far superior than the United States in terms of FDR. So, so again, so if people want to go through history and say, well, based on empirical evidence, because Senator Reynolds loves to talk about empirical evidence when it comes to you know climate change and a whole host of other topics, but when we look at the empirical evidence of economics, what was the right policy suite that worked? Well, we have um, a domestic example in the 1930s, um, and, and we shouldn't shy away from, from telling the, the public the truth that, um, that we have to shrink the debt bubble and shrink the debt bubble comes at, at, at significant short-term pain. But if we care about our children and our, and our grandchildren, and I've got three kids myself, we have to make the right decision today. Okay, John, thank you for that. Yeah. Senator, let me come back to you. Um, clearly, the question here is how much debt is too much debt. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that the issue, again, I, I sort of tried to get the conversation earlier, we didn't quite manage it, that... If you look at what happened with the, with the public bank earlier in history, um, that was a way of investing in infrastructure and creating growth and momentum that actually grew the economy and was able to actually tackle the debt that way. Do you think there's merit in that approach now? Oh, absolutely. Have you got me there, Mark? Yeah, yeah, you froze a bit. I hope you, then you came back. So have another go. Yep. Okay, good. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, John keeps saying we've got to shrink the debt, and yet he wants to increase interest rate. If you've got, you know, a million dollars in debt, you've got an interest rate of 10%, that's $100,000 added to the bill every year. You're not going to uh, shrink the debt by um, increasing interest rates too fast uh, beyond product productivity growth, right? So, and he talks about, uh, you know, job losses and, and not losing jobs. If he jacks up interest rates, and I well remember this because I was a child, a graduate in Paul Kenning's unrecession, uh, at, yeah, 1990 recession, I well remember the large unemployment rate. I think it got as high as 11.9% or 12% uh, in 1990 mm. because interest rates were too high. So for John to sit there and say, oh, well, I want to save jobs, you're not going to save jobs by jacking up interest rates and imposing austerity on the people. You're actually going to lose jobs. Uh, and I'm happy to name, look, I've said, you know, have one federal, in terms of where, where the savings are, uh, I would have one federal health bureaucracy that then basically, it, it, they basically then uh, go back to what we now have in Queensland, for example, we have Met Metro North, Metro South, we have Darling Downs in the South West, uh, we have various hospital levels, and I would let the hospitals run those, those boards and Metro North and Metro South in Brisbane, for example, I would let them run the system. They don't need the state government in the road, in the way, right? Because in my view, health is very inelastic. Uh, if I'm bitten by a snake uh, in the middle of the paddock somewhere out in the farm, I'm not going to sit on the phone uh, looking for the cheapest quotes across the country to get flown to whatever the cheapest hospital is. I want to all right. So when it comes to health, it's very inelastic. Uh, we've just got to provide good services as efficiently as possible. 
Um, on the other hand, I would push education back down into super regionals, similar to Metro North, Metro South, where I would have a competitive health, uh, education system. Uh, likewise, with energy, uh, you know, I would let you know, e each region decide what energy they want. Um, I'm happy to, you know. So, but long story short, I do not want two layers of bureaucracy at both state and federal, and in many cases, uh, also at the council level as well. So, yeah, let's start with the bureaucracy first, foremost. And I think you'll find if you get rid of a lot of these bureaucracies, a lot of that wasteful spending uh, will go because they look for ways to create, yeah, to, to spend money. But uh, back to your initial, uh, your, your, your most recent question, Martin. Yeah, productivity rather than austerity. So by all means, let's build. Let's use an infrastructure bank, and an infrastructure bank is the same as a company when they issue new shares. Uh, it's all we're doing is is we're investing in the untapped wealth of this country. Uh, and, you know, John, you know, yet again was playing silly buggers before. He's right. I mean, I was aware of the gold and silver prior to, you know, around the 1700s, 1800s when paper currency came in. Uh, but in recent history, modern history, most money has been printed. Um, and albeit, yeah, most of the time it was backed by silver or gold. Uh, and we definitely need a hard asset. It definitely needs to be backed by a hard asset, preferably not oil, because that's obviously resulted in, you know, the Iraq war, um, you know, with the US not wanting Saddam to receive payments in euro. That euro currency has actually, you know, I was thinking about it the other night. I, I think that's behind a lot of the, the aggression um, of some of the, uh, you know, wars in the 21st century, it's been about protecting the hard asset that backs that US dollar, or, or as, I should, as I should, I, I like to call it the deep state dollar, um, because you know I don't want to take it out on the US people. It's not their fault. Um, what what the swamp in Washington's up to? But I digress. Um, there's been plenty of examples of governments building infrastructure uh, and where that's been a productive measure. And uh, you know, look to summarise, give me productivity over any day, um, empowering the individual rather than centralised decision-making, um, austerity measures uh, and unaccountability by bureaucrats who think they can just destroy the economy, uh, destroy people's lives and then get away with it. Now, let me come up on there because, of course, the Federal Reserve recently published a report that said we need more monetary policy tools and so the central bank digital currency is now seen as another suite of tools that will allow them to control the economy and use their tools to better control monetary policy. Um, what you just said about we don't need more bureaucracy, we need less uh, bureaucracy, is a central bank digital currency another example of going in the wrong direction? I don't like digital currencies. I fear that they're going to be used and I don't like the use of the word currency either because, you know, that, that is a stepping stone towards a social credit system. Uh, and, yeah, I hate to impute motive and I'm, I'm doing it again, um, but uh, it, it, it does worry me. I'm just not a fan on uh, of digital currency. I want to see something tangible. Uh, it, it's got to be backed by something tangible. Um, I mean, in, in some respects with bank accounts, I mean, yeah, if it was a genuine currency, it was going to stay that way uh, because in many respects, you know, we get debited, you know, $5,000 to our account each week uh, for works. So and in many respects, that's digital, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's got to be some sort of form, you know, whatever the currency we use is, there's got to be some sort of hard currency behind it and it's got to be convertible into cash if necessary. Not, not that I know a lot of people think cash is king. I actually think that's true to an extent, but... But hard assets are actually trump cash, um, you know, in the long run because the government can always pull cash as well. And if the country collapses, uh, your cash is worthless as well. I mean, having said that, even if, even your land and assets can, you know, other than gold and you know, um, jewelry that you might be able to hide if you can, you know, flee the country, you might be able to keep those assets. But uh, the the key thing to maintaining your wealth is have, having a peace and pros uh, prosperous, peaceful and prosperous. Uh, country that provides stability so you know your wealth and, and that title doesn't get lost uh, in the overthrow of a new country uh, and yeah, just probably. and just yeah. taking it slightly further one other question which i'll get john to come in a second um there's a lot of top-down direction and suggestion from you know from the world economic forum and from other international bodies the imf you know whether it's a central bank digital currency to what extent do you think that policy is is being reined top-down into local um, parliaments around the world and local decision-making fora, rather than actually being driven from the local community 
uh, and if you like, bottom up. Because uh, to me, that's part of this really big problem. You just nail it there, Martin. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly right. And it's the complete antithesis of the, I keep coming back to the 1776 uh, uh, Revolutionary War, but that was where the world was turned upside down on its head because the, the Patriots said, we're not going to take orders top down anymore. The, you know, uh, all men are created equal. Uh, and you know, democracy is based on grassroots uh, uh, participation, and that was, you know, I mean, I know it was coming. There's been forms of it in, in Britain before that, some sort of democratic structure. It wasn't that democratic. It was still pretty much wealth driven. But um, that that is the problem in a nutshell today. That everything is top down. Uh, we live in this sort of matrix where we're led to believe that we live in a democracy, and that you know you have a vote every three years, and that you know people listen to politics. They listen to the people. Um, politicians listen to the people. They don't. Um, politicians listen to the bureaucrats. Uh, I think right now there's some uh, health conference going on at the World Health Organization where there's discussions over these international health regulations. Um, and, you know, I don't know if the health minister, Mark Butler, is over there, but I can assure you there'll be a whole battalion of bureaucrats over there that will come back uh, and make recommendations to the minister's department about this is what we should do, yada, yada, yada. Um, and the influence of those bureaucrats will probably, uh, you know, have the greater say. I mean, I, I know that I've had many meetings uh, with Josh in my time, uh, and you know, you, you could always see the pull of Treasury had a greater, you know, had a lot of influence over the Treasury. It wasn't just Josh; it was all Treasurers. You know, whenever I hear anyone say we've always relied on foreign capital um, and so forth, um, have you got me there, Martin? I keep dropping out a bit. Still right. got me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so, look, in a nutshell, uh, I'll, I'll answer this, is that it's it's probably 95% top down uh, and, you know, the occasional marginal swinging seat, you know, that member, because he might be in threat of losing his seat and the government of the day, you know, might lose government, they might start, that's when they'll, they'll start listening. But until then, uh, the system is very much designed to weed out uh, independent thinkers um and 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 that's the way our system works we've got 151 lower house seats in the country you know before like you know let, let's say generalization here but about 60 are safe um labor 60 are safe coalition so 120 members uh out of that 150 and you know you can argue a few numbers here or there they are on a career trajectory trajectory upwards they want to become you know become a part of that executive and they will say very little as backbenchers so that they can get promoted uh, and become ministers. So they, they basically have their silence brought out. And it's really, uh, and if you do speak up, you quickly, uh, you know, have the pile on by the media, by, you know, the opposition, even sometimes by our own colleagues. So uh, you know, uh, the counter yeah, you just froze there for a second, just at the end. Yeah, just say the last sentence again. You froze just at the end there. Yeah, yeah. So the so the system is very much designed to weed out people who who are independent thinkers, and you know will often put forward a counter narrative. Mm, thank you. So, John, um, question to you: top down, how much of this is being dictated by you know bureaucrats internationally um, versus decisions taken locally? Sure, sure. I'm happy to answer that question, Martin. I, I well, just can you just, yeah, could you answer that? Would be good. Yeah, but, but, but the thing is, is that, but, 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 but uh, can I just address a couple of points that Senator Rennick made? So, so because Senator Rennick was, uh, 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 made the point of um, how, do you, how do you actually get the debt to shrink? Because obviously, I mean, uh, uh, in terms of the heart of um, uh, what I believe, or is the solution and and, and and just coming to your the question you just posed of where the decision is coming from is is that because we have a financial system that is so interdependent with its globally systemically important banks etc is that the the, the policy is coming from from basel for the bank of international settlements and and all the other major central banks is they all need to keep the debt bubble going because if there's a financial crisis in one country and that starts to spread throughout the financial system, that could endanger the financial system right across the world. And so the IMF has said that if, if our big four banks were to go simultaneously, that is enough to bring the entire financial system um, to 
its needs. So we, so Australia has the, and I think I made this point uh, when we debated uh, when I debated Robbie Barr, which is that we have the power to change the course of history by collapsing the big four banks. And obviously, if we raise the interest rates uh, to a high level, that's what we're going to do. And we can basically um, reverse all of these international decisions that are being driven by the World Economic Forum and in terms of a whole other thing. Um, and so, so yes, the, so the question is, um, who's, who's running the country? It is these bureaucrats who are listening to these overseas people. And, and, and part of one of the things I will say is one of the reasons why we do have this review into the RBA was because there's effectively a revolt within the RBA where, where you had a, a, an official who resigned who basically wrote a, an email uh, to internally in the RBA, which was released on FOI, criticising the, the entire bank, criticising the board, criticising the governor, because what this official basically said was that the governor wasn't listening to the bank's internal research. But who is the RBA governor, Philip Lowe, listening to? He's listening to the other central banks. And why? Because the, because the debt bubble is so interdependent and you've got to try to keep this uh, debt bubble financial system, which is so fundamentally shaky. And, I mean, you've got to keep it going. But, but, the, so, but the question that, uh, the point that Senator Rennick made earlier is, is that how do you get the debt to shrink if you raise interest rates? Well, if you raise interest rates to such a high level, what you're trying to engender is defaults. So the more people that default, to the point that you do see a bank go, that's when the debt's going to shrink because there is less debt and let, less credit in the system. So, so what you so by raising interest rates, the whole point of my strategy is to force people to default on the debts, and by having defaults and going into a financial crisis and then into a depression, you're going to basically shrink the debt. Now, in terms of productivity, which is something that Senator Rennick said is part of the solution, I wholeheartedly agree. We have to be a productive country, but but we also have to keep in mind that when, it, when we think about economics, there is, there's a central objective as an economy we have to achieve. We have to make products that people want to buy at a price that people are willing to, willing to pay for. And so unfortunately, other than commodities, we're not making anything that, 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 is, uh, that people want around the world. Um, um, and, and we're not producing things at a particular price. Uh, look at in terms of a competitive price. And so by uh, by uh, by embracing deflation, we're going to drive prices right throughout the economy. Um, but also, can I say, Martin, is that what the debt bubble does is actually it distorts um, um, economic resources um, and it creates all sorts of uh, inefficiencies. So, for example, let me give you one example. Because we have the biggest property bubble in Australian history. We have tens of thousands of tradies in the construction sector, um, um, and the only reason why they have jobs is because of the monetary policies that the RBA has been pursuing, but also all of these um, favourable um, uh, property uh, uh, policies that state and federal governments have been pursuing as well. So if you were to pop the debt bubble and you were able to basically dramatically shrink property prices to something that is more fundamentally sustainable, all of these tradies who are working on either building new houses or doing renovations, etc., they would be needing to go um, um, and work in a different sector. And so if you have all these people who leave one sector um, and you were able to retrain them, well, then you would be able to have um, enough labour that we could actually have a competitive manufacturing sector. So if we're going to revive manufacturing, I think if, if uh, Senator Rennick can, can, can correct me on this, I think Senator Rennick wants a, a renaissance of manufacturing. I want a renaissance of manufacturing. But what we need to be able to do is is that we need to be able, we need to be cost competitive um, and we need to be able to produce goods and services that, that particularly the Asian market want at prices they're willing to pay for. And, and, and that means that, yes, we have to be smarter, we have to use technology, um, we have to um, use all the intellectual know-how that we have in this country, but we have to be a lot cheaper. Um, and obviously a lot cheaper, um, um, you know, when we have uh, runaway inflation, that creates a, a really big problem in, in terms of being internationally competitive. So, 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 so the whole idea of shrinking the debt bubble, reallocating resources um, and resetting the economy it is also, it is in the end. Now, again, these are short term measures, but in the end, it is to um, take us to where Senator Reddick wants to go, which is 
a productive and, 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 and efficient economy that, that is creating wealth. I think Senator Reagan and I want the end, end result, but, 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 but one's based on um, economic history. Um, and then obviously Senator Reagan, his own, his own interpretation in terms of how to potentially, in terms of, in terms of where, how to get to the end game. But in terms of, so, but while we completely live in this fantasy that there's no debt bubble and everything's okay, well, obviously the bureaucrats like Philip Lowe, rather than listening to his own researchers at the bank, is listening to um, uh, Basel and, and, you know, London and Washington and all these other central banks um, and we've lost complete control in terms of domestic policy. So, so again, so um, all of these bureaucrats are basically working in an international conspiracy to keep the debt bubble going. Um, and, and while we um, pretend that we don't have to deal with this bubble, we're not going to be able to reclaim sovereignty, but also our political and civil rights. And, and that's why I think um, taking the economy through a depression, which is what Joseph Lyons did in 1931, is the right solution, both politically, economically, morally, socially, in terms of civil rights as well. And if we do all these things, and we free ourselves of being so inter interconnected with the financial system, we don't have to listen to these international bureaucrats who are telling us what to do, and we'll be able to dictate our own path going forward. And we can you know, be a, a free and independent sovereign nation, and the Australian people can dictate what Australia wants to be in the future. Thank you, John. Um, I want to do two things because we're close to the end of the show. Firstly, there was this question that came in earlier on, which I think is actually quite a good way to bring this out. Um, and thanks for the super chat there. Um, any thoughts on a fair and equitable solution for all Australians to get out what appears to be a mess uh, currently in which the government simply kicks the can down the road? So the, the point there is, you know, all Australians and, and Senator, can I come to you first? How do we em how do we embrace the all Australia bit? Well, the all Australia bit is to try and keep people in their jobs, uh, and where we do need to make uh, you know cost savings, for example, so saying that in the bureaucracy is that we shift people from non productive jobs into productive jobs, and that's the best way to deal with you know uh, re, re transitioning our economy is by, you know, as I said, this infrastructure bank that set about, set about building things, you, that, that, that will require labour and that labour will come from our battalions of financial engineers, battalions of academics, battalions of gambling sh machine operators uh, and get those people out of those, those non-productive jobs and into uh, productive jobs that are going to generate a re recurring uh, form of income way into the future. Um, so... Um, you know that that to me is the best is the best way to do it is is, is to ensure that people don't lose their jobs and also uh, don't the the other you know um, all Australians is that you know people were told interest rates weren't going to go up or implied uh, until twenty twenty four so it's not fair to to you know jack interest rates up too fast on those people. Um, so you know yet again you know it, it's the same it's the same answer most. Yeah, well, uh, to most of these problems is that we've just got to get productive and start building. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, so what I want to do is, is, is allow just a, sort of a, a summation from each of John. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to sum up your position and then I'll come back to the Senator and then we'll close the show at that point. So, John, over to you first. Sure. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Senator, for uh, participating in this lively debate. It, it has been quite enjoyable. But, uh, um, you know, if, we, if we're going to get to the crux of the issue is that um, there is no equitable solution. There is no solution that, that, that does not involve pain. And so uh, while and, and maybe Senator Renick will say that I have the luxury of telling the truth because I'm not an elected official, whereas when you are a victim of democracy um, in, in a parliamentary system, you basically have to tell people what they want to hear. So, um, and, you know, I mean... From Wollongong, we, we, we tend to be more frank than perhaps the, than the people from Chinchilla. So um, yeah, here in Wollongong, uh, you know, if we're going to give you know, the, the honest and direct truth and, and tell people uh, uh, how to get out of this, there will be pain. There has to be pain. Um, if you through, look through every economic situation throughout the course of human history, which is 6,000 years of recorded history, there has never been a solution without pain. And so there is no 
equitable solution. Some people will, will suffer more than others. But the question is, how much pain and how quickly can you get to a viable solution? Um, the only way to do it um, is, 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 is the old analogy of, if you have a Band-Aid on your knee or your elbow, do you take the band off slowly or do you take or do you rip it off very quickly? And so the faster we get to the correct economic solution, the faster we can get to the economic nirvana that, that, that we have to that we have to uh, that we want to get to. But but in but in summary, my position is there is we, we have the biggest debt bubble in Australian history. There is no fantasy solution. The, you know, uh, we have to make hard decisions. We have to tell the public the truth that they don't want to hear. Um, um, and, 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 and if we don't, mark my words, Martin and Senator Rennick, we are repeating the mistakes of the Weimar Republic. And when you have runaway inflation and an out of control uh, public sector and a social culture, you, per, you create the conditions for extremism. And that's what happened in Germany with the rise of Hitler. So, so we are, as we go through to, to, to 2030, if we don't come to grips with actually bring this economy into some semblance of order, um, not only will the ongoing economic uh, pain that will happen, because cause can I just say this, because again, going back to my morality, people are suffering today. People are suffering today in 2023 because of the decisions of the parliament in 2020 in terms of this record stimulus package. So there is pain today. And, they, and, 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 and under Senator Rennick's uh, policies, that pain will continue with this record mortgage and rental stress. So the only way to get this stress under control is to get the inflation under control. Um, and the only way to do that is through some form of, or in, ter in terms of austerity. And, and so, so that's how we have to get to um, fixing the problem. Um, and uh, you know, I've been saying it since publicly since 2016. I'll continue to say today, um, the parliament and the, bureauc and the bureaucrats don't want to face the demons that this country is going to face. And that's why um, I continue, look, even though I want a depression, even though I know it's the right solution, the likely scenario is we will have stagflation, uh, ongoing cost of living pressures under Albanese. It's going to get worse under the current government. Um, um, and, 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 and whenever the next recession or financial crisis uh, comes about, the RBA is going to double down and print even more. And that's when we could easily see some form of hyperinflation. And God help us if that happens. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. And Senator, across to you for your uh, your closing remarks. Uh, well, look, uh, thanks for having me on tonight, Martin. And uh, thanks to all your listeners um, for, you know, bearing with us for an hour and a half. That's uh, been a long time, given that a lot of it's from John. Uh, and he's got me very much a dry economic rationalist. Uh, and I have to say, you know, economics uh, economists are to the finance industry what climate scientists are to scientists. They, they basically live off modelling um, and, uh, you know, and, and these, you know, theoretical ideas. But in the real world, you know, we need to build, uh, and I don't know if there'd be an economist out there would actually know how to build something uh, that could actually, you know, build infrastructure or something productive um, and not an actual model. So, um, uh, look, you know, I think I've said everything I've needed to say tonight. We need to be productive. Um, I'm totally against the austerity measures of the RBA and uh, raising interest rates too quickly. Not saying that we shouldn't raise interest rates, but we really need to look at quantitative easing in a productive manner. Um, we do need a more efficient form of government, so we need to get rid of, rid of two layers of bureaucracy in this country. We are clearly overgoverned. Um, and, and we need to basically empower the individual. I mean, I think we're going to get out of this, um, you know, and I'll speak about building our way out of this, but we also need to rebuild uh, the individual and empower the individual to give them uh, the strength and the confidence uh, to know that they can get on uh, with their life uh, without the government in it. Because, you know, I, I know I speak to many people uh, up here in Queensland. I know the police force of morale is very low here. There's record numbers of police leaving here in Queensland, in Victoria and WA. Um, I know the nurses have got very low, um, low morale uh, and, you know, this is a symptom of, and, and, and just people everywhere, you know, whether it's because of mandates, vaccine injuries uh, or, or other, you know, government intervention, uh, we need to get government out of people's lives. And, uh, you know, that that will also help. I mean, I know that's maybe a little bit touchy-feely, but I, I, I know that that 
you know, putting economics aside, that is a real issue out there at the moment. And, and I think you nailed it before, Martin, when you said there is a very top-down approach uh, in the world today and we need to go back to 1776, where I always do, uh, and find inspiration in those people that said, no, no, um, you know, we'll, we'll decide, um, you know, how, how our country is run and we want to stay in running it. And, you know, we're not going to have unaccountable or unelected people um, either in Australia or, or offshore telling us, how to live our lives. So I'll leave it at that. And thanks very much for having me on. Uh, thank you, Senator. I really appreciate your time. I've had quite a few people in the chat saying, please get him on again. So I'll chat with you, see whether we can get you on, uh, you know, a little bit later, because I think there were some really important points there. I will make one point. You know, one of the things that digital allows is actually much more participation from individuals. So in theory, the idea of democracy bottom up should be facilitated, enabled by digital. I mean, that seems to me to be an amazing opportunity that, that I'm not sure has been really thought through right so that's something else just to well, sort of well, know, it's, been, it's been thought uh it's been thought through all right martin mm. uh yeah as i said to you earlier just last week we've had the white house uh thanks to elon musk and the twitter files it now turns out that the white house has been censoring uh social media so what you say is social media is an excellent uh way to empower the individual and give individual voices mm. uh however we've got the big end of town whether it's big government or big you know, big corporations or big media who see this as a threat, uh, and it's 1776 all over again uh, in, in a digital sense of the word, whereby, you know, people who speak out uh, or, you know, push forward a counter-narrative are being censored, and we just cannot have that. Uh, and if we go back, I know I keep harping on this, but the First Amendment was the freedom of speech, you know, and, you know, we've now got, you know, evidence or it seems to me that uh, Twitter files is revealed that Biden and his cronies in the White House uh, actually violating the First Amendment, and that is just absolutely unforgivable. No, that's a very good point. Well, I think there's a really interesting conversation we can have another time about some of those broader demographic, demographic, and demo, uh, you know, and democratic issues because it's so critical. Thank you both very much. Really appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to take you offline now, and then I'll close the show because we're way over time. But thank you both very much for your participation and your willingness to engage and uh, you know take a bit of skin off each other as well. Thank you both. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, John. See ya. So there you go. I hope you found that um, interesting and educational. I certainly learned quite a lot tonight. And uh, I want to say thank you to both uh, parties for going in, you know, boots and all. Just to say that um, next week, uh, Robbie Barwick's uh, coming on. We're going to talk about a public bank and how that's going to play out. And there's a whole campaign running about um, uh, things like, uh, for example, the uh, question of regional banking and things. So join us with Robbie next week. And um, just to say finally that there is a poll running at the moment. So I'll be interested for you to vote in the poll. Um, it's on the, on the, on the uh, chat there. Who do you think won? Was it John? Was it um, uh, the senator? Or was it a draw? And I can tell you that at the moment, the results are that Senator Rennick is 33, John is 42 and 25 said a draw i'll leave the poll open just a little bit longer for uh, people to um, uh, vote if they haven't done so just to uh, uh, make it known and finally i will just show you the doggies they're still there they've been pretty much <laughs> there the whole night <laughs> and uh, i think they're out for the count so i want to say thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening i hope you found some interesting points there and um, you know it's always interesting trying to facilitate these things by letting people have their head but also trying to steer it a little bit so i hope you felt we did a reasonable uh, job of that too so thank you very much take care have a good week uh, check out our recorded shows uh, over the next few days and uh, we'll be back uh, next tuesday with robbie this is martin north from digital finance analytics Signing off. Cheerio.